Good morning. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Good morning. Got a lot of folks jumping on already. Glad to see you guys jumping on. Let me know if you can hear me okay. I didn't put my microphone on this morning, so I'm not sure if the audio is okay. Mark says five by five, fantastic. A lot of folks on this morning. Give me one second to get adjusted here. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Brother Jeff says good to go. Good morning, Troy. Good morning, Jocko. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Jeff. Christopher, good morning up there in, the, in Brooklyn. Good morning, sir. Rasmic, good morning. John, good morning. From Ground Zero in Virginia. All right. Okay, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Wow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Got a good show for you this morning. Got a lot of stuff to cover. So we got uh, 15 live viewers on right now. Sounds fantastic. Thank you for joining me for Coffee with Rich. Uh, if you don't know me, and I think everybody on here does, retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, former corrections officer, former Sheriff's Department Special Operations Officer, Regional, Man Regional Manager for Disaster Preparedness, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, co-founder, co-host of the American Warrior Society, American Warrior Show. Good morning to Coffee with the Rich. I'm back, two week hiatus while I was in Europe, and I'm happy to be with you guys this morning and share some things with you. Like, share, comment, uh, really appreciate that. Uh, Rich, good morning there, Rich Alloway, and good morning to my, my brother-in-law, Chief of Police out there in Woodbury. Good morning, sir. We're gonna talk about a few things here this morning. Uh, number one, I got a, a new American Warrior Society hoodie. Not sure if you can see this, and no, this is not a heart on my shirt. It's actually the flag of Ireland. And if you don't know, the green represents uh, the Catholic Irish. The orange represents the Protestant Irish, of which I am uh, a member, maybe some of you too. And the white is the peace that stands between them, or so they say. But this is one of our new hoodies, and I really like it. If you, if you want to check out where to get one of these hoodies, AmericanWarriorsSociety.com or AmericanWarriorsShow.com, and you can pick up one as well. Got 21 people on this morning. Man, got a lot of stuff to cover this morning. <clears throat> Let's see who else is on here. Rick is on. Good morning. Paul is on. Good morning, Paul. Mr. Will Parker is on. Wonderful. Let's talk about the first thing I got to talk about is an article with you here on Coffee with the Rich. And the article we're going to talk about is an article I wrote years ago. It's called Exploring the Myths of VCQB. And if you don't know what that means, it's Vehicular Close Quarters Battle or Vehicle Close Quarters Battle. Now, here's the deal. Here's a couple things. <clears throat> I wrote this article because I see a lot of things online. Uh, when I wrote this years ago, the flavor of the day seemed to be everybody was teaching a vehicle CQB course, everybody and their brother. And uh, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that there's some myths out there about get off the X, bro, uh, is one of the common ones. <clears throat> the myth of that is that this get off the X idea, well, the reason it's flawed it's as if you step one step to the right, draw your handgun, and now the adversary don't know where you went. And the matter of the fact is, you are the X. If you're being attacked, you are the X. You can't get off the X because you are the X. Now, where that term comes from and where the confusion comes about is, it's well intended. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not pooping on anybody that's, that's running around saying that because what they're saying is, if I've set up an L-shaped ambush, and I'm waiting for people to walk into it uh, so that I can commit premeditated murder because that's what we did in, in the military when you set up an ambush. You're premeditatively killing a group of, of individuals. So I've created an X 
And when you walk into it and, and they, we initiate the ambush on you, the idea is get off the X because our interlocking fields of fire only work well in that predetermined kill spot. So anything you can do to maneuver off of it increases your survivability. The problem is when you take that concept and you translate it into you're in an alleyway, you're getting a tab, someone's attacking you violently, a violent felonious assault, the idea that you can get off the X, it's just you, man. You are the X. So there's a couple things before I go on. There's, I share with you guys six things that I think are important on that. But before I do, let's see who's on here. All right, we missed you, Rich. Will says, hey, I missed you guys too. <clears throat> Paul says, good morning, Rich. Welcome back to the States. Your pictures from overseas looked amazing. Uh, yeah, man, um, I try to share some of my travels with you guys. I don't put it on the American Warrior Society Facebook page. If you want to follow me, uh, I'm sure I'm easy to find. There's a lot of Rich Browns out there, but only one of them manages the American Warrior Society. So hit me up, send me a friend request if you, if you uh, are a somebody that watches Coffee with Rich, I'd love to share some of my daily goings on with you. Kevin says, good morning. Jeff Day has joined us. Justin Wilson has joined us. My friend, Brett Parker has joined us. Kevin, good morning. Uh, Justin, hope you had a great time. Looked fun. I did, brother. I had a wonderful time. And uh, I was hoping I could have done one from the cottage, but when we were at our cottage out in the Highlands, but I'm gonna tell you, the Wi-Fi was terrible. We almost had no signal on our phones which is part of the beauty of being way out there, you know, in that remote location is you, uh, you're out there alone. So getting back to vehicle CQB, here's, here's what I don't hear from a lot of those vehicle CQB courses. And again, they're, they're well intended. Number one is keep driving, keep driving. Uh, I understand that in law enforcement military, sometimes we have to stop the vehicles and we have to disembark and we have to fight that's, that's their job. If you're not military or, or current law enforcement, keep driving. The vehicle is your weapon. Speed is your security. Mobility is the key to your survivability because if you stop that vehicle and decide to engage, you knowingly, uh, like I remember one time we had a question um, on the American Warrior Show, somebody had written in, and it was, it was a good question. I'm sure uh, they, they meant it well, but they said, Hey, how do I put the vehicle in park and then draw my handgun? What do you recommend there? And said, you know, if your vehicle is drivable, you're not putting it in park, man. You're gonna push on the accelerator and get out of there. So let me say that again. If the vehicle's operable and you're being attacked, keep driving. The vehicle is your weapon. Speed is your security and mobility of that vehicle is your survivability. Please don't forget that. When I wrote this article, <clears throat> and again, all of our articles are for free. You can find them online at AmericanWarriorsSociety.com. It doesn't cost you anything. Exploring the myths of vehicle CQB is this morning's article. And um, here's the deal, man. Uh, a lot of people think you can fight around a vehicle. There's 16 points of cover on, on a vehicle and you can do all this stuff. I'm gonna tell you right now, if you decide to fight in that vehicle or in the close proximity of that vehicle, you're probably gonna die in that vehicle or in close proximity of that vehicle. And if you do not believe me, I've got two real world cases uh, that I explore in this article. One of which is the cartel, this was uh, back in March of 2012, the cartel down in Mexico decides to get in a gunfight with the Mexican Army uh, Patrol in Nuevo Laredo. And they decide to fight from inside their vehicle. And at the end of the uh, gun, gun battle, Let's see, they seized 12 rifles, one loaded rocket launcher, one grenade launcher, one 40 millimeter grenade, various weapon magazines, lots of ammo, a package of cocaine, and three vehicles. And it should be noted that inside those three vehicles were lots of dead cartel members, lots of them. I, I provide you all the gory pictures on the article exploring vehicle CQB myths. <clears throat> and then somebody says, well, Rich, you know what the problem is, bro? And I say, what's the problem? And they say, the problem is, see, these cartel guys don't know how to fight in and around vehicles. If they did, they would have stood a better chance. Fine, I hear you. I preempted that remark with, uh, I explore another gunfight where the Federales decide to fight in their vehicles. And you can see three dead dudes in the back, all wearing body armor, all heavily armed, and all three is dead as fried chicken. And uh, there's three dead dudes in front of the vehicles. Like I said, go on there, you check out those pictures for yourself. They're pretty graphic and you can 
recreate a lot of the, the context there. Because the, the only thing that's gonna save you if you decide to fight in and around that vehicle is six things. Real easy. Number one, your ability to seek, employ, and exploit available cover. That's it. Uh, number two, your ability to affect it. Let me go back to number one because I, I wanna understand this. Your ability to seek cover, employ that cover, and then exploit that cover to its full advantage as you, uh, as you fight. Number two, your ability to effectively use concealment to maneuver on your uh, adversaries or your threats. <clears throat> because that's exactly what Platt did in the gunfight down there in Miami. He maneuvered, he got away from the vehicles, he maneuvered through the trees and, and came around and, and killed two FBI agents. Number three, your ability to ac accurately put effective rounds on your threat. Number four, your ability to communicate. And number five, the number of well-armed friends you can bring to the, the fight. And perhaps more importantly, luck. <clears throat> I've got 31 live viewers on right now, 32. If we reach 50, who knows what I might send today. I'm, I, I might reach into my grab bag and, and pick something other than a tumbler. So please like and share. So uh, let's see what comments we got before I move any further. Jeff Day says, welcome back. Gerald has joined us out there from Oregon. Good morning, Gerald. I know it's really early where you are. Appreciate you joining me. Jocko out there in South Africa says, amen on keep driving. Jocko says, even in the military, mobility is key. You have to maintain uh, freedom of action and the vehicle is your best bet. Absolutely, Jocko, 100% agreement. Vehicle is concealment, not cover, and essentially it becomes your coffin. Jocko, spot on, man. <clears throat> Again, like I would tell you, these are some well-intentioned instructors out there that will tell you that there's 16 points of cover on that. And that may be if the bullet lands at precisely the right spot, uh, at the precisely the right velocity, and the precisely the right caliber. But it doesn't always work out that way, so get away from that vehicle. Or stay in it, Elke, and keep driving. Elke Monroe has joined us. Brett Parker, good morning, welcome home. You were missed. Randall, good morning, and uh, having it on here, Randall. Greg says, good morning. Keep driving, yeah, okay. So exploring the myths of vehicle CQB, take a look at the article for yourself. Uh, the article wasn't intended to bash any instructor out there that's teaching a lot of vehicle CQB stuff. I think it's well-intentioned. There is a time and a place when you have to fight. The vehicle just will not run anymore. You've done all you can. It's time to get out of that vehicle and, and put some rounds on target. Okay, let's talk about show number 208. We called it, uh, I think Mike entitled it a bump in the night debrief. And it was a little uh, a debrief on an incident I had on the farm. At the end of the day, it was kind of a nothing burger. Nothing really happened. I didn't shoot anybody and didn't put my hands on anybody. But I think part of that was the way it was handled. Uh, and there's a lot of lessons for you in there. Number one is I always kind of make fun of people that are civilians that run around with battle belts. I'm like, come on, man. Do we really need a load-bearing vest or some sort of battle belt or... Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Is there really a place for it? And I come away a bit of a believer. I'm gonna, um, I've already made a battle belt. Maybe we'll have that as something on here with Coffee with Rich. I know Mike and I are talking about me coming down to Oklahoma and maybe filming some content. One of those might be battle belt. <clears throat> we talk about uh, verbal de-escalation a lot in there because I think that was one of the keys to why it didn't work out poorly. And let's see, we also talked about, you know, checking your ego, checking your pulse. I could have screamed and yelled at the guy that I caught trying to steal something from my truck. I chose not to. I chose to, uh, you know, get him off my property in the most expeditious way I could and keep, keep control of the situation. So, you know, it's like the, we had a, a medical professional here one time that says, before you check your patient's pulse, check your pulse and bring it down before you engage. So I think that's probably a pretty good advice. All right, so please make sure you click and share. We got 39 live viewers on. Um, John Dalton has joined us. Let's see. Let's see. Jeff, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, Battle belt, pepper spray, yeah, absolutely. I put one together. I'm pretty proud of it, man. I'm, I'm going to train with it a little bit and see how it goes and uh, maybe mess around with it because I I still don't have an ALS holster yet for that battle belt, and it's not going to be fully functional until I do have some sort of retention device on that handgun. Okay, so that's the article. All articles are free, AmericanWarriorSighted.com. Talked about the show, show number 208, Mike and I did, I think uh, came out December 29th. 
pretty interesting show. I enjoyed making it. And we've got really, really great reviews from it, so check it out. All the shows are free. It doesn't cost you anything. You can go to American Warrior, AmericanWarriorShow.com and listen to the shows, or you can uh, download it on your iPhone or Android device. Let's talk about the gadget this week. <clears throat> gadget this week is gloves, man. Gloves. And before I start showing you my gloves, I'm going to talk about, I think there's like three types of gloves. There's your normal dress gloves you wear out in town. There's kind of a tactical uh, glove, and that's more of something for, for shooting or operating in the context of military or law enforcement. And finally, there's just a functional glove that you might wear on your farm or to, uh, to load lumber with or what have you. So when I, when I evaluate gloves, I kind of sketched out some things. I'm not sure that this is exactly perfect, but I, when I was working on the show last night, I'm like, what am I looking for? Number one, I'm looking for in a glove, range of motion. Can I get full range of motion and do I have good dexterity of wear? If I was a pianist, could I play the piano in these gloves? And if the answer is, no, nah, I don't, I can't even make a fist with it. It's not the right glove, it's not the right size. I need to move on. And one of the things you'll see when I show you some of the gloves that I have here, one of the things that you're gonna see is the consistency of the sizing is not there. I've got some medium gloves that fit well. I've got a large glove that fits well, and I've got an extra large glove that fits well. So you're gonna to have to try these things on and determine whether you have full range of motion and dexterity of wear. Number two is, do they provide me protection? And protection comes in a lot of different ways. Uh, fire protection, are they no mix gloves? Do they offer any protection from, from fire or flame? Do they offer protection from bloodborne pathogens? Obviously a latex glove does, but it, and it gives me great dexterity, but it may fail in some of the other things we're gonna talk about in a minute. Does it protect me from sharp objects? And when I'm talking about sharp objects, if you're a law enforcement officer, I might be talking about a puncture injury from a, uh, a needle or something like that, or something, a slash. <clears throat> so punctures and lacerations are what I'm looking at there on my protected. Cold, is, is cold a consideration? Do I want the gloves to protect me from, from frostbite? Impact resistance, are the gloves, the palms impact resistant? Do they have padding there? Do they have padding on the knuckles to protect the knuckles? Uh, friction burns, will they protect me from getting blisters if I have to use ropes to do a lot of my work? So those are just some of the things that when I think about protection, that the glove's gonna afford me that level of protection. And um, so number one, range of motion or dexterity of movement. And number two, protection. We talked about all the different ways a uh, glove can protect you. Number three, functionality. Uh, what I mean by functionality is, are they washable? Are they touchscreen compliant? Are they water resistant? Uh, can I shoot in them? Do they afford me the ability to do pocket entry? I like the knuckle protectors, but a lot of times you can't get your hand in your pocket to retrieve your cell phone or some other items of your EDC <coughs> because the knuckle protectors are so so uh, big. So that could be a problem. Number four, they're comfortable. And what I mean by that is can I wear them all day without fatiguing my hands? Could I do jujitsu with them and not fatigue my hands? And if the answer is no, you know, about an hour and they start hurting, you know, my joints, then they're probably not the right glove for you. And uh, number five, finally, wear resistance. You know, are these a pair of gloves that are gonna stand the test of time? Am I gonna get more than one use? So like a latex glove would fail on that, but that's fine, it's, it might be a single use item. So anyway, enough on that. Those are some of the criteria that I look for. Again, range of motion or dexterity. Number two, protection. We talked about all the different ways a glove should protect you. Number three, functionality. Uh, you know, shooting is another one. I don't know if I covered that one, the shooting is a functionality. If you're not a shooter and the glove is never going to be used for shooting, maybe that, that can be crossed off your list. I think everybody joining me this morning on Coffee with the Rich is probably in that boat. Number four, comfort. Can you wear them all day without fatiguing your hand? Number five, are they uh, wear resistant? So let's take a look at what folks are saying. Uh, John says, good morning. Still out in the dark out there in Arizona. Hmm. Anytime you survived the encounter, you did something right. You kept moving, which made it hard for the hiding person to attack you. Great job. My good friend Doug Ryan's an outstanding Marine is joining us this morning. Good morning, Doug. Gerald says, across the range, mechanic gloves you recommended. Yeah, we're going to talk about those. Brett says, if you wear gloves, you have to shoot with gloves on and training a lot. 
Yeah, I w absolutely, we'll talk about that. We used to cut the trigger finger off so we could better fill the trigger. I'll talk about that. Walt Davis has joined us. So, my first foray into tactical gloves occurred when I was a young infantry Marine, way back in the early, early 90s, like 91, 90, 90, 89, whatever. So, and here they were, still around. And like Brett said, you know, these were uh, my gloves when I was in the infantry and I needed gloves. Now, as you can see, just like Brett said, I wanted to feel that trigger. These are Nomex gloves, flight gloves, leather palm. They, they cover up to here. Uh, really, really good gloves. I like to have the thumb out too so I could work the safety lever on uh, M4 weapon system or, you know, uh, 1911, I think back then is what I was using a lot. So these were these were pretty damn good gloves. I really I really like them. I uh, bought these when I was a very young man, weighed about 170 pounds, soaking wet. My hands have gotten larger with time. I can still squeeze into the gloves, but I'll probably need a bit bigger size. If we use the criteria for these gloves, can I get full range of motion? Absolutely, very dexterity because I've cut I've cut out the fingers. I can pick up a dime with this, no problem. I can shoot easily with this. Uh, there's there's no issue there. If I'm in a um, if I am in a situation where it's burning and I have to get someone out of a vehicle, uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna really damage these fingers right here. But you know that's okay. Am I gonna get cut on these with uh, that are open? Absolutely. So again, it's a trade off between what you like. So that's where it started. These gloves are probably 30 years old. They're still in great shape. You know why? Because Leather boot polish on the gloves to take care of the leather. Uh, mink oil and, and other kind of conditioners on the leather. Take care of your gear and it will take care of you. We're up to 40 live viewers. Please like and share. Uh, let's see. Someone, uh, we keep seeing comments about mechanics gloves. Let's go ahead and talk about them right now. These are probably the gloves I wear the most. And yeah, they're mechanics gloves, uh, and I almost wish they weren't because they've got such a, a cliche around them, and that's okay. They're f absolutely phenomenal gloves, and they deserve some of the uh, rec uh, recognition that they get. I prefer, as you'll see on all these, I, I don't have any synthetic palms. I think the synthetic palms for me, they're not normally as breathable as leather. Uh, they don't break in. When they break in, they don't break in as well as leather, and I don't think they afford the protection as leather. Before I go any further, let's see, we got a question here. Mark says, what do you consider to be acceptable trade-offs? You know, it really it depends because, like I said, the gloves can kind of come in three categories, in my opinion. There's the dress glove that I'm going to wear out in town with my honey. There's the tactical gloves that I'm going to use to shoot and do some of the things I do. And then there's the functional gloves, and these are functional. I keep these in the side panel of my truck. Um, we use a wood burning stove here on the farm, so these help me. Uh, I go down to the sawmill and get my lumber from the sawmill, the scraps and stuff like that. These are phenomenal. If I'm uh, putting fencing up on the farm, these are a phenomenal gloves. I can't recommend them enough. They don't have the knuckle protectors. They're a little padded, but I can stick my hand down in my pocket easily. The palm is not overly protected. Um, so I really like these. They don't have a strap that secures here. I find that they're, what do they call it? They call it the uh, fast fit is a, is a phenomenal thing. I can shoot with these gloves on. Uh, they're awesome. Can they protect me from bloodborne pathogens? No. Um, are they cold weather rated? Not necessarily. So you have to decide what trade-offs you want. I mean, they do make some that are, that are for winter wear. I would rather my hands be a little cold working on the farm for a few hours and have the dexterity of movement that these provide me. Let's see. <clears throat> so I hopefully answer that question for you, Mark. AJ says, mechanics gloves all day and night. Cheap, easily replaceable, and thin. Former instrumen don't need protection, just comfort. Yeah, and, and these fit the bill, dude. I love these. This is probably my third or fourth pair of mechanics gloves. Find the pair that's right for you. Uh, but these are phenomenal. Uh, I just can't, can't recommend them enough. For all around use, Mechanics gloves. Then we've got another pair of tactical gloves here, and I believe these uh, from, were from my brother, Jeff, Mr. Jeff Brown. And these are Oakley's. And these are, 
I keep these in my go bag. I don't use them as much because they're just kind of riding in my go bag. I use them from time to time just to keep them broke in and treat them. I've had them for probably at least 10 years. These are the only ones I have that are, have the knuckle protectors on them. And like I said, some pair of jeans, I may not be able to get my pant, uh, hand all the way down in there because of it. But I do like the ability for some of my gloves to offer me that additional level of protection. And when I used to ride a motorcycle a lot, uh, I always wanted the gloves that had the knuckle protectors. I don't ride motorcycles much anymore these days. So finally, <clears throat> these are kind of some of the tactical gloves. These are kind of my dress gloves, and um, I'm going to show them to you here. This is what I wore all over Europe several times. Big fan of these. Uh, these are leather with cashmere inside of them and Thinsulate, and they are phenomenal. They're all leather. My wife got these. They were, these were high-end, freaking very expensive leather gloves, and for the first several years of their life, they sit in my drawer and I'm like, I can't wear these. He's got cashmere inside and they're really soft, lambskin leather. And I just afraid I'm gonna tear them up. But you know what I ended up doing is one day <clears throat> I put them on and used them. And then I started using them more and then I would let condition the leather and minkle the leather. So now they're very waterproof. The cashmere, you know, does not, uh, when they get wet, they still keep me nice and warm. Unbelievable dexterity. I could wear these, no problem. And then I started, I said, let me see if I can go and do all the things on the farm with these on. And guess what? They've been phenomenal. I've had these for probably 15 years at this point, And they're no, no worse for wear. Because again, take care of your gear and they'll take care of you. But I have done everything. Hauled in dozens and dozens of load, loads of wood. And all the farm tasks that I do with these on. And they still look good, fit good, and they function flawlessly. So, can't recommend those enough. 42 live viewers. We're talking about gloves this morning to, uh, to protect your hands and, and, and aid you. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, I, 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 the name is Mechanics Glove with an X on the end. We have those for our cert teams. Mark does. Yeah, they're phenomenal. And, and you know, with regard to cert team... And stuff like that, I mean, you might want to find a glove that is Kevlar reinforced on the inside. They do make those hatch gloves out there. Some of them have, you know, uh, powdered leather in the knuckles, like sap gloves. So there's all different kinds of stuff on the market out there. But uh, check them out. AJ says, Oakley gloves wear out too fast. AJ, yeah, I hear you, man. I, I'm, I haven't used mine much. One of the things that I really don't like on, on these Oakley gloves is... I don't really like this. I don't think that's necessary. I think the mechanics fast fit has shown that you don't necessarily need that additional thing to do at the end. I've had these for 15 years. Like I said, I don't use them much. I would give them good wear resistance for, for the 15 years that I've owned them. But again, I do not wear them as much, so maybe that's part of the problem. Gerald says motorcycle shops have a variety of gloves. Yes, they do, and, and that's a great place to start. Phil Strader said, Rich Brown, you handsome devil. Good morning, Phil. Uh, it takes one to know one, sir. You definitely know what a handsome man looks like. You see one in the mirror every day. American Wars, I'm nearly 50. We're at 41 live viewers. Mike Seeklander has joined us, but he's been here all along. Phil says he wants to take some boxing gloves to Mr. Mike Seeklander's face. Ouch. It got dicey real quick here, folks. Um, <clears throat> let me back up real quick before we... Uh, leave the glove topics. One of the things I wrote down here that I failed to uh, talk about on this vehicle, CQB myths, was uh, I was in a Middle Eastern country one time and I was driving a vehicle. And I had a senior Marine behind me and they start setting up a hasty roadblock in front of us. And I see the barricade going up and, and I'm slowing to a stop and the senior Marine behind me hits me in the back and says, go. And we were in a Humvee and we uh, we, I drove around the roadblock into the sand, up and over and around, and and kept going, and got us back to base before the the local uh, police showed up, and they eventually did, and they eventually, you know, uh, the, somehow trickled down to the command, and I was asked, did you do that? And I said, yes, I did, and they're like, well, in the future, don't do that. Okay, no problem, I won't do that. But in the but in that moment. I felt it was the best course of action. If you can keep driving, keep driving. 
vehicle is your weapon, mobility is security, and uh, speed is security, and mobility is your survivability. So I want to tell you that I, I actually have had to do that before in a foreign country, and I'm fine to do it. But there again, of course, I'm, I'm uh, acting within a country that we have a SOFA agreement with. If I'd have tried that when I was in Europe and went around a, a blockade, then I probably would still be in Europe right now on some form of legal hold. Uh, AJ says mechanics has the impact gloves. They have a huge variety of fits and selections for mission to determine the needs. Yeah, the mission does determine the need, man. Absolutely. And uh, mechanics gloves have been used the entire war on terror, and they're they've deserved, uh, they've earned the reputation that they have. And and check them out. Let's see. Josh says new viewer here from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Simplify, brother. First tanks, 1999, 2003. Ooh, right. Josh, glad to have you. Simplify, brother. Mark says simplify as well. well. We got 43 live viewers. We talked about gloves. Next week we're going to talk about one of my gadgets that failed me in Europe. And if you want to learn what gadget let me down and how I'm going to get around the failure next time. You're going to have to join me from next Friday and find out what that gadget was that really didn't work out. I think I was able to use it only once or twice. It, it didn't work well, and, and I've got to work around, and we'll discuss it next week. But I want to tell you right now about my story, how I visited a gun store in the UK. I uh, visited one in Northern Ireland, um, actually on accident. We stopped in to get some coffee at a little coffee shop on our way through Northern Ireland to the Giant's Causeway. And let me back up for a minute. So I'm driving through Northern Ireland. It's one lane roads, uh, windy, hilly. Can't really see around the corners. It's a single lane road. I'm driving on the wrong side of the road. So a lot of things to add a little bit of stress. And then I start seeing these signs. We're going through these Catholic parishes in Northern Ireland where of course there was a lot of terrorism. Uh, and I start seeing these signs that say, Dowry to keep out. Dowry is poison to our children. Um, uh, fight Dalrita and all this kind of stuff and I'm looking at my son who's acting as navigator in the front seat next to me and I said man that don't look good we're, we're Protestants in this vehicle and we're going through Catholic hell territory and these signs that say Dalrita get out Dalrita was a uh, uh, an Irish tribe that took over Scotland way back when and if you didn't know the context you wouldn't know what they were what they were trying to warn you of that you were not welcome there so when we got to the next town and stopped for coffee <clears throat> in a more Protestant friendly environment, I just happened that there was a gun shop next door. And I'm like, hey man, I got some American Warrior Society stickers in my back pocket. Let's jump in here and uh, give some American Warrior Society stickers out to these guys and then uh, find out what's going on. So as soon as I introduced myself and handed out some stickers, they took me back in the gun vault and uh, we talked about gun laws. And one of the stories that they shared with me was one of their friends was walking across his farm with an air rifle shooting varmints or something. I don't, I don't remember what it was. But he said he walked back in the house. He walked from his barn where he had his air rifle back to his house and a helicopter landed on his farm because someone had saw it and they had called the police and they, the police launched a helicopter to this man's farm and wanted to see all of his weapons and all of his uh, certifications for those weapons. So it is crazy over there. They said that, um, I forget what they called it, it wasn't red flag laws, but he said, if, I, if somebody sees me stumbling out of a pub, they're gonna call the police and the police are gonna come to my house. If I have, a, if I you know cut someone off in traffic, they're gonna call in my tag and they're gonna come to my house and start taking away my guns. When you get a permit over there to purchase handguns, they call your physician and want to see all the documents about your mental health and physical health over there. So you, you remember when it comes to the Second Amendment's fight that's going on in Virginia right now, and again, we need to keep them in our prayers and thoughts and do everything we can in the states around them that, to support those folks because when the Banning of this stuff happens, it doesn't stop there. It only gets worse. You know, in uh, Ireland, in the UK, I showed you uh, two weeks ago my UK legal knife. In Ireland, it's absolutely legal to, to carry a knife unless you have verifiable proof on you as to why you have that knife. I found that humorous because sitting in the Dublin airport, 
there was a whole pile of knives right there, steel, metal, nice, serrated knives that I could take and use to cut my sausage up before I boarded my flight. And there's no one keeping custody on this jar of dozens and dozens of knives. So in a country that you can't carry a knife for any reason, they give you one in the, in the airport beyond the security checkpoint. That doesn't make any sense. I could have taken that knife, slid it in my backpack, and nobody had known to walk right onto the airplane. Absolutely bananas. It's not security, folks. It's the illusion of security. Part of visiting a gun store, I want to talk a little bit about to those folks about self-defense law. And, um, you know, they don't know what our self-defense laws are in the U.S., uh, they wanted to see, you know, we talked about concealed carry and they were asking me about that and I showed them a lifetime concealed carry permit in Tennessee and they were literally like passing it around and all oh, rubbing it and looking at it. It was amazing. But they talked to me about um, Tony Martin. And Tony Martin is, uh, was a farmer in the UK who shot and killed a 16-year-old that was uh, burglarizing his house with another, another person. The person he killed, the 16-year-old that he killed, had just bailed out that day, I think on his 23rd offense, and he's only 16. So obviously the, the laws were doing nothing to, to stop or deter the 16-year-old kid from, from uh, home invasions. Well, Tony did. He shot and killed this guy. Tony Martin did. And for that, he was found guilty of murder for shooting uh, at two men that were burglarizing his home, home invading him, and he went to prison. So Tony Martin is the litmus test kind of in the UK for, for these kind of things. And you can look it up for yourself. But one of the reasons that hurt Tony was he had a shotgun. Uh, it was a Winchester pump action 12 gauge shotgun that um, when he purchased it, it was legal. But then they changed the laws and said if the shotgun can hold more than two rounds, it is now falls into the laws for pistols, handguns because the magazine capacity exceeds two rounds, so now it falls into like a, uh, a handgun. It's crazy, but that's exactly where the law was written. So he didn't re-register that gun or have it or surrender it or whatever, and because he used it in that manner, he was found guilty. Another thing the laws do over there is, Tony was found guilty on a 10 to two split. The majority of the people found him guilty of murder, 10 people, those two that, that didn't, and the states he would have gotten acquittal, not there, it's a majority and you go to prison. Because one of the things that is really huge over there is um, proportionality. Like we would view proportionality here in the States of if you're attacking me with a claw hammer, I can shoot you with a handgun because a claw hammer can cause death or grievous bodily harm or injury, what have you. Well, so can a handgun. That's not the case there. And I asked him to explain that to me, the, the guys that worked at the gun shop. <clears throat> He said, it's n never gonna be viewed reasonably to shoot anyone, even in your home with the guns that you possess legally. It's never gonna be appropriate. If they come in with a, or well, maybe if the guy had a gun, and that's the only case. If the guy comes at you with a screwdriver, you can only use uh, a screwdriver or, or a knife uh, or something like that. You cannot, if somebody comes in with a knife, you can only use a knife. You can't use a gun. He said, if somebody comes out with me with a, a, with a shovel on my farm, this gentleman in, in uh, Northern Ireland, I can only use, say, a cricket bat or a baseball bat uh, or something like that. I cannot use a gun. Uh, it's absolutely bonkers over there. So you have to make the mental calculus in the middle of the fight. Uh, is, is this equal to this? Yeah, okay. Is this equal to that. I mean, it's, it's bananas. And in a case in point, I'll share with you, this happened last year in the UK. A guy named, um, his last name was Osborne hyphen Brooks. He was 70 something year old man. Two men broke in on him. They had knives. I'm sorry. They had, uh, screwdrivers. That was the, the thing that they used for their home invasion, a screwdriver. Well, Mr. Osborne Brooks grabs a knife shows it to him, threatens him with it and says, mine is bigger than yours, lads. You know, you might want to get out of here. And uh, one of the perpetrators ends, ends up dead. And what was interesting about this, this, potential, this particular case that we talked about was that the old man basically had to say he ran into the knife in order to get out of the, or he would have been, he was charged with murder. 
and ultimately got acquitted of it because he said, well, the guy just, he came a screwdriver and just ran up on me and basically liked to give me a hug and accidentally stabbed himself with it. And that's, that's what he had to say. Now, if he would have shot that person, those two men in his house with screwdrivers, that old man would, would be done. So it's, it's bananas. They don't just want the, your handguns. They don't just want your rifles. They want total control. Case in point. If you go to the UK or Ireland, I challenge you to find a police officer outside the city. Challenge it. They don't sit on the side of the road run radar. They don't drive anywhere. They're not there. And um, good luck with that. Because the part of having CCTVs everywhere is, if you think of the context of law enforcement, it's just that. Something to enforce the laws that are there. It's not necessarily to prevent anything. It's just, we have video evidence of what happened now. We can go in and charge the people that's there. So self-defense is up to you. Uh, but then, then they don't give you the tools to, to affect that. One of the things I took a picture, I'll put it up on American Warrior Society's Facebook page today, was when, you, when we entered the United Kingdom, there was a huge sign on the wall as you came in, and it said, if you've entered the country with, in, with any of the following offensive weapons... You need to uh, go and report them immediately over here or you're going to be, you know, the full extent of the law is coming down on you. It's my opinion, and I'm no legal scholar, but it's only the use of the weapon that determines whether it was an offensive weapon or a defensive weapon. You see what I'm saying? But they decide that a knife is an offensive weapon. It can only be an offensive weapon and all these things. And even it says, and you'll see this when I put, post the picture today, that one of the offensive weapons that's illegal is self-defense spray, and that's exactly the way it's determined. Self-defense spray is it listed as an offensive weapon and it's illegal. So again, I tell you, um, watch out, folks. And with that being said, that's all I got for you today. Uh, let's see what kind of comments we got here. Uh, AJ says, sounds like an IRA ammo point for guns. Haha, <laughs> yeah. Uh, as we were driving through that area, I was kind of like, hmm. I don't want to stop here, bro. So again, make sure your vehicle is operable. Make sure you got plenty of gas because you never know when you're outside the country what kind of area you're rolling through. Elkie says, on the other hand, do they have mass shootings in Ireland or stabbings like London? That's a good point, and I don't know the answer to that. I will tell you that the only place I did not feel safe at all was in Dublin. Uh, Dublin seemed to be a dirty uh, city. Again, didn't see any law enforcement at all while we were there. Didn't feel safe at all while we were there. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just me, but uh, I didn't like didn't like uh, the Republic of Ireland at all. Really enjoyed Northern Ireland, but but not so much uh, the Republic. Yeah, uh, Rasmirik says the, you, they use trucks in Europe instead of guns, mowing people down on sidewalks. Again, you know, okay, they're using trucks offensively to kill people. Do I need to report that I have a truck while I'm over there? It gets kind of kind of crazy. Tammy is on. Mr. Rob Wren is on. Unfortunately, progressives are working to bring European laws here. Yes, they are, Jim, and that is unfortunate. Contrad contradicting, contradicting themselves with the OC spray. Yeah, and I think that they do that because they can even outlaw. If you say self-defense sprays and you don't really say um, you're, you're talking about pepper spray or OC spray or, or some sort of chemical irritant spray, that's how you can get get away with banning like the far marking dye that was never intended to harm anyone. It was just gonna mark the perpetrator's face who's trying to kill you. But if you say, well, all self-defense sprays are illegal and they're offensive, then you can't even have something to mark the guy that tried to kill you. Uh, Jocko says, even here in South Africa, they consistently trying to take our weapons. And you guys definitely need them down there in South Africa, man. It is. Uh, you guys have some serious problems, and, and Jocko, down in your way, down in South Africa, there's always a lot of vi uh, videos of how people use their vehicles successfully uh, to get out, of, get out of danger, a lot of carjackings and stuff down there. Anybody have any co uh, questions or comments for me now that I'm back to the U.S.? Remember, uh, check out the American Warrior Show. Mike and I are having another show queued up for you, hopefully by this weekend. Check out the AmericanWarsCenter.com for all your free articles, about 200 articles there written by some really 
industry experts, not just me and Mike folks, but a lot of amazing people. Yeah, the left trying to ban weapons all over the world. Again, it's about control. Anywhere weapons have been banned, they don't come back and uh, it just gives the, the governments another tool of oppression, in my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. I think if you're watching this morning, you probably agree with me. It's got 31 folks on this morning. I'm going to give another minute and see if anybody got any questions or comments for me this morning. If not, I'm going to respect your time and let you get on with your day. Hopefully you enjoy talking about gloves a little bit, something that we don't normally talk about. And hopefully I'll give you some things to consider when you're uh, having a litmus test for is your glove the right glove for you. Jim says, have a good weekend. Elky says, glad you're back. Have a good weekend. Folks, I hope you have a great weekend and stay safe out there. And until next week, remember, the fight is coming. Be ready.